This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and happy new year to all of you. This is the first Human Action Podcast of 2020. It is, in fact, January 1st, New Year's Day. And our guest is none other than Bob Murphy, Dr. Robert Murphy. So, Bob, great to talk to you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, Jeff. I made a resolution. I want to talk to Jeff Dice more, and I'm getting off to a good start. Well, I want to just give a little background about what we're talking about today. And our subject is actually money mechanics. Now, what do we mean by that? You know, a few years ago, I happened to come across an old article. It's out of print now, but it was produced by the Fed Reserve Bank of Chicago up until about the 1990s. It was called Modern Money Mechanics, a workbook on bank reserves and deposit expansion. So if you look at this article, which there's still old PDFs of this uh, out there uh, on the internet, we'll actually link to to one of those. Uh, but if you go to the introduction of it, it says, the purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. And so when I worked through this a little bit, it's actually kind of tough sledding uh, this particular article, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's aimed at an academic audience, but it's certainly aimed at an audience that has some understanding of central bank operations. So uh, I, I sent it around to a few different professors and academics in our circles, and some of them actually began using it in their, in their classrooms, etc. So it got me thinking that those of us who have some sympathy towards the Austrian school of economics tend to be very critical of central banks, and in particular the Fed, for those of us who are Americans. But yet a criticism that's often weighed against us and with, I think, some validity is that we don't necessarily understand the commercial or mechanical side of banking uh, as well as we do the theoretical. So I shouldn't say we, I'm not an economist, but I'm, I'm the conduit between economists and the audience. Uh, in other words, we understand a lot about theory when it comes to money and credit creation. The Austrian business cycle theory is obviously a big part of the Austrian worldview. But we don't understand as much how central banks and commercial banks and retail banks actually operate, how money comes into being, how interest rates are set, how it all flows throughout the economy, how this has an interplay with treasury debt. It, you know, it's all very complex mechanically. And I thought, well, what if we had our own version of an article or a book that helped explain this and give it some visuals, give it some graphics, you know, make it very understandable for a layperson? I thought that that would have a lot of value. And so I reached out to Bob Murphy and said, hey, let's discuss this idea of creating a, an article or a series of articles on money mechanics. And so as Bob and I fleshed this out, it became clear, hey, why don't we have a bunch of short chapters, have them come out in a serial manner, and then when this is all done, we'll have a book or an ebook or something where we want to keep it pretty short, maybe 100 to 150 pages, and that this will really help people understand uh, Fed money mechanics. So... We, we worked on it. Bob uh, produced an outline of chapters. Uh, and so we think that this book is going to be a bunch of really short, digestible chapters. And so the series of articles, which Bob is in the process of writing, are going to begin coming out on Mises.org uh, here now in January 2020. They will continue for every other week, biweekly, for a period of months until we've gotten through all of about 13 to 15 chapters. And then at the end, we'll put them together into a book. So all that said, I hope the audience uh, understands where we're going with this and sees this as a, as a worthy venture. And I think it's going to be, Bob, a, a book that really simplifies and demystifies this process. And in that sense, I think it's going to be very valuable. So just, just give us your sort of overarching thoughts. Well, sure. So uh, I was real excited, Jeff, when you pitched the idea to me. And I, and I thought, yes, there is a need for this. And I had independently come across that Chicago Fed primer on money mechanics or whatever that you know that however they described it and i thought that was great at the time like it actually sort of encouraged me that because it was it was compatible with the stuff rothbard did in his work that you know that i was more familiar with and so it just kind of reassured me that yeah this is you know this isn't some weird old austrian thing like this is what um the the standard canonical view is of these th topics and so yeah I, I think also too because central banks are now doing so much more than they were before the financial crisis of 08, that more and more you sort of regular people want to know, yeah, what's, what's going on with this? And so it is, especially in the age of the internet and short attention spans, you know, people aren't going to read 300 page treatise on banking. And so I think, yeah, that this is going to, what I would like this to do, number one, is just to 
be a reference so that any college professor would, would be comfortable, you know, giving it to the kids in his class. He might say, okay, now in chapter eight, they get into the Austrian theory of the business cycle. I don't particularly agree with that, but that those first seven chapters, that's just all standard. That's, that's great stuff. Let you know the organization of the Federal Reserve. Like what's the open market committee? What's the difference between, you know, the, the presidents and the board of governors? You know, just little things like that that we all hear referenced in the news, but we probably don't actually know exactly how it all fits together. That's one of the things that I want this uh, this series to answer. Yeah, and I don't think for the most part it's going to ha- have an Austrian flavor. It's going to be descriptive, just how how this stuff works. I mean, that's that's obviously the idea behind the book. Well, right, exactly. That I want it to be very you know non controversial. Just you know, this, these are just factual statements. That it's all in one nice spot, like you say, with good graphics. So it's not just a bunch of dense text. Just so people can very quickly get up to speed on this is how the Federal Reserve works and central banking more generally, how is money created? Because that's something, too, that, I mean, it's, it really is a, you know, I think that's why, you know, it was called the mystery of banking. When you really understand, like, the, how there's a sense in which a commercial bank by granting a loan, to give an example, Jeff, the kind of thing I've seen a lot of libertarian hard money types, sometimes they act as if it's only fiat money central banks that can, quote, create money out of thin air. But actually, there's a sense even when regular old commercial banks, when they advance loans, do the same. And so just things like that, that there's a lot of sort of nuts and bolts that I think it would help people if they just had a sort of, you know, one spot where they could go and just see it all spelled out clearly and then they'll click for them. Yeah, of course, some people with with perhaps very superficial knowledge will just say things like, oh, the Fed just prints up the money to cover the deficit or that sort of thing, which is obviously just grossly factually untrue. Right. In terms of, I mean, there's two things concerning about that. I don't know which one you meant, like the fact that they aren't like literally running printing presses now for a lot of when the right. Fed creates money. But also, too, and, and this and this is some of the stuff that we're going to get into, you know, perhaps later in the series, but issues about, you know, modern monetary theory. And is it correct that like when the federal government runs a budget deficit, do they just instruct the private, you know, the does the Treasury just say create more money? So a lot, lots of things like that where we will just sort of get in and just lay out the, the material just to try to help people make sense of current policy debates and things like that. Because with a lot of these things, I think part of the problem is there's a lot of talking past each other and the layperson doesn't really know what the underlying reality is. And so it's hard to understand when certain people, you know, pu- push a political recommendation under the guise of, oh, this is just standard, you know, this is just the way the world works. When, well, no, actually, you're, you're smuggling some stuff in there. Well, I hope our listeners will seize on this opportunity because I would argue not only do m- many, maybe most economists not understand money and credit creation in a fractional reserve system or how the Fed or the ECB or whatever actually operate on a mechanical or technical basis. I would even argue a lot of monetary economists, people who specialize in this stuff, don't really understand. So there's there's an opportunity here. And I also think that uh, you know, sometimes our critics will say, oh, you know, the Austrians don't really understand this stuff. You just you just look at it theoretical. So, you know, all that said, I guess first and foremost, you and I had discussed having some sort of article or chapter discussing money creation, money and credit creation in the U.S. before the Fed, which was obviously a big part of our history. Um, so you intend to address this. Right, exactly. That I, so the, the period too, like yeah, the, which would be the the gold standard, and just you know how how does that relate? And also to th- this is another misconception. A lot of times, Austrian school economists, or I should rather say, lay people who are fans of the Austrian school, will say things like, "Oh yeah, the, the business cycle is caused by central banks," and then that leads you open to the criticism. Oh well, wait a minute. So before the Federal Reserve, there were no recessions in the United States. You know that kind of stuff. So yes, definitely want to get bring in some some historical material there, partly to explain how, how did the gold standard actually work or what was the relationship between the gold standard and this these other things we're talking about. But yeah, just to, to know how did this stuff happen before the, the Fed even existed. And also too, Jeff, I might add, I don't, I don't want to forget this, to say this. You mentioned, what, to me, one of the things that we definitely want to tackle in this series is there's a recurring critique of when you see the Austrians or just any, you know, mainstream economist even giving the orthodox explanation of, oh, well, the Federal Reserve buys assets and that creates reserves and then banks go out and they lend. Re-. 
And a lot of people will say, no, no, you guys got it backwards. In the real world, if you knew anything, if you left your textbooks, you'd know that banks make loans first. That creates deposit. So we're going to definitely tackle that particular objection. I'm sure many listeners have heard that and maybe even are sympathetic to it. Just to just, just try to reconcile that because it does seem like there's two camps out there. And I think there is a way to, to reconcile those two views. But um, in, in practice, it often comes off that, oh, no, you guys are just looking at your textbooks and you don't know how banking actually works. Right. And so a series like this, I think, needs a little bit of history and background on, on money and banking. And so even listeners who maybe even haven't read uh, Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money or haven't read much in the in the world of monetary policy or monetary economics, they'll get a little bit of history and background here, but in a nice, succinct fashion. Right. Yeah. So there's not going to be any – everything that's in here will be there because it needs to be in there. Put it that way. Like, we, we don't want to waste your time. We know we're going to give you as much as we think is necessary to get the point across so that, yeah, when you read the, the chapter on a certain issue, you know, it's, it's digestible, it's quick, but it's comprehensive. So some treatment of money early in the U.S., some treatment of the, of the classical gold, gold standard, some treatment of history like Bretton Woods and that sort of thing will be included. Oh, yeah, d- definitely. Okay. Let's sort of put that aside for the moment and move into the Fed and its creation in the 1910s. Uh, first and foremost, let, let's just talk a little bit about the basic structure. So you have the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank itself, it's, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. That's where the chairman of the Fed uh, sits and works. That's where a lot of economists sit and work. So what about the 12 Fed member banks? What are they? Where are they? Why are they? Well, I mean, they're they're spread around the country, and of course, we, you know, we may get into some of the history and that originally it was based. So there there could be banks right now that are in areas that you might not have picked, and that's because oh, back then that was more commercially uh, relevant. And also, one of the things we're going to cover in this, in terms of the history, is to show that originally it was more decentralized, right? That they were mm-hmm. the the governors, they, you know, they were called governors, and then they got changed to being just bank presidents. So, in other words, the the, the regional heads used to have more authority, and then it was in the 1930s um, under the Roosevelt administration that power was more migrated towards the board of governors in D.C. and that the other members now were called president because among bankers, governor is a more prestigious title than president, and so that that's part of what, what happened. So. So, yeah, there's a lot of history even just in there. It's not that the Federal Reserve was in its modern structure and form at at the outset. And, of course, too, there's a whole, you know, and here, we, you know, we got to be true because I'm sure many of our listeners know there's a whole genre of, you know, the creature from Jekyll Island. And and it's, you know, it is, you know, that that is true. Like, it really was a secret meetings between people. And they really, you know, why they call it the Federal Reserve. You know, even though there's the joke going, it's neither federal nor reserve discuss. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that, that was the issue that, you know, the Americans would have been very skeptical of a central bank. And so they were trying to make it look like, oh, it's this decentralized thing. So the, all that stuff is the fascinating history that, of course, you know, is a, a lot of people have, have seized on and, you know, taken it in, in strange places. But, you know, that's that's stuff. People aren't making that up. There really is this this background history here that's that's pretty scandalous. Well, and listeners need to come out and meet people like me and Bob. We're going to have an event at Jekyll Island this coming October 2020. So go to Mises.org, check your calendar, come see us, come meet us. It's going to be fascinating to be you know right there and talk about all of this stuff. Um, so the 12 Fed member banks, as you indicated, that's where the economic power was early in the, in the history of the United States. I don't think you'd have one in Cleveland today. You'd probably have one in Phoenix or something, some big population center, right? I mean, they're... They, they sort of show an East Coast bias as to where the 12 are located. Right. And so, yeah, I think that's a combination of, again, you know, the, the economic power structure you know, back then. But also, yes, it's just there were politics involved even even back then. And you can and you, and you can see it like even so to this day, like, you know, it's still the case, obviously, that the the head of the of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, you know, has a lot more power, whether, you know, in, in terms of both officially in terms of the structure, but also in practice. So you, you see all those elements too, and that, that was certainly true back then as well. And in some of the structure, you know, might be a legacy of of the, the, the political power dynamics back then and sort of carries forward to today. 
So I, I just want to stress the idea of the podcast today is to get people interested in this series of articles and reading it so that we're, we're not here, you know, in today's podcast to understand, to explain everything about the mechanics of money to you because we would be here for the next, uh, you know, 10 weeks or something like that. But so you're, you're going to have some information about the structure of the of the Fed, how it's made up, the board of governors and, and all that. So I'm very much looking forward to that because I think people are murky about that. I, I certainly am. And, the, you know, another term I've always been murky about is this concept of primary dealers. So these aren't actual Fed banks. Uh, these are commercial banks like Goldman Sachs, for example, but they trade directly with the Fed. And so uh, I, I think we have this idea that that primary dealers are somehow closer to new money and credit creation. That, you know, just give us, you know, a quick take on what a primary dealer is. Well, well sure. So I think, yeah, the, in, in practice, the issue is when the the, when the the treasury runs a deficit, you know, so the government, and this is something too, though, again, these are real simple things and we, you know, we've got experts in the listeners who know this stuff like the back of their hand, but other people it might be murky for them. And this is also too why I want to be clear, you know, to try to sort out the MMT claims, the modern monetary theory people, because I think sometimes they blend this together and act like it's all the same thing when in practice, you know, it is technically different. But yeah, when the federal government runs a budget deficit. So the U.S. Treasury spends more than they take in in tax revenue. They have to borrow money to cover the gap. That's a budget deficit. They issue bonds. And we know that simultaneously, the Federal Reserve often is, in a sense, creating money out of thin air with which to go into the market and buy bonds that are issued by the federal government. But they can't just do it all in the same operation. And because both in appearance, you know, in both in the letter and spirit, that would look like, oh, wow, they're just monetizing the debt. Look at that. And so, yeah, the, the primary dealers, um, one way to think of it is they're, you know, they're the ones that are buying the, the bonds at auction and then, you know, in turn, then can sell them to the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve can't literally just cover the Treasury's deficit. They have to go through intermediaries in the private sector. And so to the extent that you know, those players can, you know, perhaps it act early on a, a Fed announce, you know, be, do things before it's actually announced or just, you know, just sort of get ahead of the market. There's a lot of allegations that th they have a special, you know, relationship and they, they benefit from that, that cozy relationship that it's not just a, a frictionless, pure market the way it's often depicted in a standard textbook. Right. But from a free market perspective, they're, you know, they benefit, of course, but also there is a task assigned to them, which is to make a market, to be there available uh, to, to purchase treasury debt at a, at a reasonable bid price. So, uh, you know, that's not a free market if there is an implicit or de facto backstop for federal debt, right? I mean, for treasury debt, if that's always there, that would seem to me to be an artifice of sorts that props up uh you know, treasury debt, the value of it. Oh, oh, right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I hope I wasn't coming off like I was disagreeing with th that sentiment. I'm just saying in practice, yeah, that, that's, that's partly what's, what's going on there that they want to give the appearance. And that's why too, that during, so especially it was from like 2009 through 2011 or so that you had the federal government was running, you know, trillion dollar plus deficits while the Fed was engaged in its various rounds of quantitative easing. And so I always thought, huh, that's that's kind of a coincidence, isn't it? That the that the the Federal Reserve has decided it's, you know, its monetary policy objectives for unemployment and inflation happen to coincide with massive bond buying right at the period when the government is also issuing, you know, <laughs> huge amounts of new debt. So yeah, I, I think in practice obviously those aren't independent decisions. Um, but again, just strictly speaking to understand the mechanics that, yeah, that it, it's supposed to, the treasury has to auction it to the private sector first, and then those in turn get sold. And as you say, it's not just, you know, Joe Schmo who gets to go and, and, and get it. And then the fed buys it off of him. So the whole thing, yes, the, the federal government benefits from that backstop. And also there is, there is a benefit to being, you know, one of those privileged few that, that get to handle those contracts. So in your articles, are we going to you know, start to understand the relationship between the central bank and then 
uh, primary dealers and then regular commercial banks and then maybe your local hometown retail bank. I mean, how this money or credit creation sort of flows out to a credit union, let's say, in Auburn, Alabama? Right, exactly. Yeah, that's that's one of the goals that for sure we want to accomplish with this is to try to, you know, using graphics and and perhaps a numerical example, but yeah, just to, but also, as you say, to keep it like, like real, you know what I mean? Like to mm-hmm. maybe document a, 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 an actual string of transactions that really happened in history just to kind of show this, this process so that people can see enough of the theory so that the reader has a framework. You know, it's not just a bunch of statements about then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. They know how to interpret it and, and file it away, but also to keep it realistic enough so they can, you know, hang that theory or that, that framework onto real world events so they understand what's going on. Because you're right, that there is that gap that right now you can read stuff in the Wall Street Journal about Goldman Sachs or whatever, but and then you you look at a standard money and banking textbook and it's it's too abstract. And so that right. that's what I think this is trying to do among other objectives is so that the yeah, the reader can understand how is it that Fed policy is impacting, you know, when I go to get a car loan or something, you know, what, what, what the interest rate is. Well, there's so much opacity there. I think it's just because there's so many steps involved. I mean, if you go into the credit union in Auburn and, and borrow 30 grand or whatever it costs to buy a Honda Accord, where does that money come from? Where did it originate? Where does it reside on a balance sheet? Is it an asset? Is it a, is it a, a you know, a deficit? It's, it's really, it's really pretty fascinating to think about what ought to be a very simple operation has been made so complex. I think that's the reason we have the title, The Mystery of Banking. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Jeff. And I, I would just say, too, that, yeah, it's well, for people who know how balance sheets work and stuff, like for a regular business, like, you know, regular accounting, when I show them, I, I can very quickly, if they already have that knowledge and know how assets and liabilities work for a regular business, when I show them what goes on with m- commercial banking, the way it's practiced, you know, in modern times, it's for some people it's mind blowing like they it's cuz it looks like it's magic or like wow they shouldn't be allowed to do that you know <laughs> that kind of thing and that's that's where of course you know the 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 wing of the, of the austrian school that is against fraction reserve banking you know that's that's partly where that's coming from is just to say look at this there's something weird going on here um so in the, in this series you know we're not it's it's the goal is to make sure everyone understands how it works you know that we're not going to try to beat some people over the head with our preferences or, or, you know, our views on what's, what's desirable or not. But, but yeah, that, that is part of what goes on. And if people haven't really understood it, and that's kind of Jeff, what I meant earlier when I said, I think some libertarians even have this idea that, oh, the only kind of weird stuff going on is with the federal, with the central bank creating money out of thin air. And I'm going to say, no, even at the local level, there's, there's something going on that a lot of people, when they see it and understand it, think that's, that's just unusual. It's mysterious. Put it that way, as you say. So we will have in one of the chapters a treatment not only of fractional reserve banking versus full reserve banking, but we'll also have some explanation of the money supply. In other words, what is the money supply? What are the various different aggregates? Most people are probably familiar with things like M1, M2. So we're going to have that kind of nitty gritty detail. Yeah, exactly. Because again, one of the things is I want you know a college professor who's teaching undergrads on money and banking that if somebody says, hey, you know, is there some good primer somewhere. Oh yeah, go that that thing's fine. You know, even if someone who's not an Austrian would mm-hmm. just say that oh yeah, the, the factual statements they make about the organization and the monetary aggregates and the way to think about it. Yeah, go read that that that'll get you up to speed real fast. But what we won't have in this series of articles is any argumentation about fractional reserve banking versus full reserve banking. We'll just explain those two things without getting into it because that's a whole nother topic. I, you know, I want to touch on interest rates. A, a, Sometimes we say colloquially, oh, the Fed sets the interest rate. Well, it doesn't really. It targets what's called a federal funds rate. So can you talk about that for us? What's the federal funds rate and how and why does the Fed target it? Okay, sure. Yeah. So the definition of the federal funds rate, or sometimes it's called the Fed funds rate for you know short, is it's – so commercial banks have reserves – uh, and, and and that consists of money that's either deposited that the commercial banks have on deposit with the Federal Reserve System itself, or with actual currency like in the vault, right? So that's that's you know very high powered money as it were, and commercial banks can make loans of those reserves to each other, 
And so the federal funds rate is the interest rate that's charged on non-collateralized overnight loans of those reserves. So it's, it's an interest rate that banks char- regular commercial banks charge each other when they lend reserves. And there's various reasons, like why would one bank want to you know, get more reserves and things like that. But at various times, banks, for various reasons, some want more reserves than they have, and other ones have excess reserves. And so they borrow and lend those amongst each other, and the interest rate that they charge is what's called the federal funds rate. So that's what it is. And then, like you say, Jeff, the for various reasons, it wasn't always this way, but for a while now, that's one of the primary things when the, when the press says, oh, yeah, the Fed set interest rates at such and such, or you know, they held pat, that's what they're referring to. And as you say, it's not a price control. It's not like raising or lowering what landlords in, in New York City can charge on rent-controlled apartments, where in a sense you say the government set the price. So here it's not a, it's not a, a price control the way the Fed, the Federal Reserve ultimately tries to affect the, those interest rates is by buying and selling assets primarily. And, and now since the financial crisis, they're using new tools as well, which you know, we're going to cover at some point in the series as well. But, but that's, that's what goes on. And, and one last thing I'll say is this is another area of criticism that the conventional, not just Austrian approach, but even just standard textbook uh, money and banking uh, approach gets hit with is people to say, oh, yeah, in the grand scheme, central banks you know, don't have any power to control interest rates anymore. It's all you know, international global commerce and Chinese savings and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot of claims. But before you get into to trying to referee any of that stuff, you need to know exactly what the terminology is and, and what do you mean by these terms and, and what can the Fed do? Right. And, and readers may or listeners may be familiar with John Tamney, who writes at Real Clear Markets. And he's kind of in that camp, although he's sympathetic to us and to Austrians. He's in that camp that the Fed doesn't really matter. Yeah. Let me if I yeah, if I might uh, just because I realize I might left people hanging there. So just, just to finish that train of thought. So because what the commercial banks are doing is, is lending and borrowing reserves from each other, the Fed, the Federal Reserve has the direct power to create or destroy reserves through its buying or selling off of assets. So if the Fed wants to create more reserves, it just buys more assets. So that's the, the lever through which the Fed can affect the federal funds rate is because they can affect the supply reserve. So to go back to the, the rental you know, uh, price controls on, in the rental market, if somehow the government could magically create or destroy apartment units, then that would be a way they could affect the rental price of a unit in Brooklyn without, you know, inform, you know, putting an actual price control in place. So that's kind of what goes on. And that's the weird thing with money and banking is there's, a, you can quote, create reserves out of thin air, you know, in that functions just like regular money in a way that, you know, just snapping your fingers and saying, oh, here's claims to more apartments doesn't create more apartments. Right. And they're not flipping a switch overnight that affects the interest rate you pay at the car dealership, let's say. I mean, it's it's a little more obtuse than that. Um, but ultimately, the Fed funds rate, the rate at which banks borrow can borrow overnight from one another for to meet reserve requirements, uh, that does filter out to us, right? I mean, that affects the so-called prime rate, which is the rate given to really good, high-quality borrowers, and that ultimately uh, the, the Fed funds rate, which was very high, uh, during Paul Volcker's tenure in you know, 79, 1980, when Jimmy Carter was president, Reagan was coming in. Uh, ultimately, it does affect retail interest rates that you and I pay on our mortgage, let's say. Right, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, a commercial bank, if it can, if, if some other commercial bank on an overnight loan of reserves is willing to offer certain interest rate, the commercial bank would never loan those funds out to a regular person from the public at a lower rate, right? In other words, lending to another commercial bank for an overnight loan is a much safer risk. So clearly, the federal funds rate is going to be a floor on most types of other, and and as you as you say, Jeff, that if the federal funds rate goes up, then that means clearly all the other rates have to go up, and usually there's going to be some some spread in there because there's more risk involved. If somebody takes out a mortgage or whatever, that's a riskier loan than just lending reserves overnight to somebody else, not to another commercial bank. So that that is the the sense, but there's there is slippage. It's not that a mortgage rate is always X percentage points above what the Fed funds rate is, and I, and people saw this too during the in the in the immediate wake of the financial crisis, 
even though the federal funds rate came down to basically zero or a little bit above and was held there for seven years, it's not that regular consumers who were <laughs> drowning in credit card debt all of a sudden you know, saw their APRs go down to 2% or something. You know what I mean? So there, there is that element too. And that's partly why so many people are hostile towards you know, the banking system or, or the, the big banks is that they, they know something was kind of fishy with all that and the ostensible goals of those rounds of QE to sort of keep credit flowing the main street that, yeah, there, I think there is some justification for the people that thought yeah, that, that that wasn't really what was going on there. Well, Bob, I hate this disconnect, though. I mean, even today with interest rates at historical lows, even negative on European uh, corporate and sovereign debt, you still have, you know, here in America, you have poor people, subprime borrowers going to these shady car lots, going to these rent centers they're paying, you know, 20% plus. So, I, I mean, there is a populist argument here that this doesn't benefit uh, average people so much as it does the banking class. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's true more generally with government intervention. So, for example, I've done some, a lot of work on, you know, the energy sector. And there's, like in the 1970s, there were price controls that were put in place on crude oil. And there were a lot of arguments that accounts were making showing that that wasn't actually the, the ostensible goal was, to, oh, we don't want the Arab oil embargo to be making, uh, you know, Americans have to pay more at the pump. And, and so, we, you know, we don't want the, the owners of oil deposits to be pocketing that windfall gain. So let's limit. And that wasn't suppressing prices at the pump. It was more that the refiners and the intermediate stages, they were just pocketing the gains rather than the owner of the oil deposit. It wasn't trickling down, if you will, to the consumer. So I think there's a similar thing here that, that yes, uh, if somebody is a poor credit risk, you know, that no matter what happens in terms of the Fed buying mortgage-backed securities or treasuries and showering trillions of dollars, you know, into um, the financial sector, ultimately, if somebody's a poor credit risk, nobody's going to lend them money at a low interest rate. That's, that's just not going to happen. And so that people need to realize that it, when political figures and others try to justify those bailouts saying, oh, we got to bail out Wall Street to keep credit flowing to Main Street. People need to realize there often is that disjoint. Well, and of course, we're talking about the federal funds rate. We have to point out that something very important happened in 2008 around the time of the crisis. Uh, The then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson really helped push a bill through Congress, which was we, we call it the bank bailout bill. But it was called the Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. And as a result of that, it sped up uh, earlier legislation by Congress. This wasn't the Fed just deciding to do this. This was congressionally authorized that the Fed would start paying interest on excess reserves held with the Fed. This is the first time in history. So a lot of people have argued from different spectrums uh, of the econ sphere that you know when the Fed started paying interest on excess reserves, this was a big game changer. So is that true? What should we think about this? Okay, so it's definitely true that they started doing that right in October. Right. I think it was October of 2008. And certainly that it, it drastically altered Federal Reserve policy in terms of what, like what they were allowed to do. And so in particular, and, and this, you know, I'm not speculating here. Like if you go and read what the Federal Reserve was saying in its statements at the time and, you know, what economists were commenting on it, the idea was they wanted to uh, continue to buy treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to try to stabilize the housing sector. You know that was the, that was the thought. They remember there was they calling them to- uh, toxic assets that those those bundled securities that had mortgages that were building on them. And so once the housing market crashed, those things all of a sudden nobody wanted to touch them. And so to prevent a sort of cascade effect where. One investment bank goes down, and then because they go down, it starts dragging everybody down. The Fed comes in and starts buying up all these mortgage-backed securities to try to stabilize that sector. But normally, in terms of textbook, open market operations and, and monetary policy, that would flood the market with a bunch of reserves, and normally that would push down interest rates. And since they were still worried about price inflation, because remember, oil prices had been really high the previous summer, um, the Fed was saying, okay, we want to be able to divorce those two aspects of what we're doing. We want to, on the one hand, buy and sell assets because of our objectives in terms of stabilizing the housing sector, for example. But on the other hand, we also want to set 
the federal funds rate at a certain level that we think will quell inflationary pressures. And so, you know, again, normally it's you do one or the other and it locks it in. So that's what they were trying to separate. And, and this, again, the, the mechanism they used was they, for the first time in October of 08, started directly paying commercial banks saying, if you have reserves, we will start paying you interest on them. And so that was a way, so they could affect that. And so they could sort of keep it bottled up at the bank. The bank would not go out and, and lend reserves to a regular borrower unless the person was paying a higher interest rate than what they could get for sure from the Fed. So it was like the Fed started paying, you know, on their ch- on a checking account balance to the commercial banks, keeping their money parked at the Fed. That's a way of thinking about it. Whereas before the Fed was paying 0%. And so by doing that, again, that allowed the Fed then to flood the market with new reserves in the QE program when they wanted to buy assets for other reasons, but it, didn't, it, it allowed them to independently set the interest rate. So in practice, for a long time afterward, it didn't matter because the Fed funds rate was basically 0%. But then once they started raising rates, that's really where you saw, Jeff, the, the distinction and the importance of that new tool was originally when the Fed started quote, tightening and raising interest rates, they, did, they didn't sell off assets because they were afraid if we start selling off mortgage-backed securities, we're going to crash the housing market. So they were able to raise rates without selling assets, which normally you wouldn't think would be possible. And that's because they just raised the interest rate they were paying to the commercial banks. Right. And currently, the interest on excess reserve rate, it stands at 1.8%. And so Bob, as you say, this is a de facto floor. No, no bank's going to lend overnight to another bank at a rate lower than they'll get at zero risk from the Fed. Right, exactly. So that's that's the way. Yeah, the Fed can, and you know, if the Fed wants to lift all the spectrum of of interest rates, yeah, they can just raise that floor with the the rate they're paying because they, yeah, like you say the, the Fed's not going to default. Like the Fed can just create money electronically without you know legal constraints. So yeah, a commercial bank. The, the safest thing they can do is keep their money, their reserves parked at the Fed and earning that guaranteed rate. Right. And according to my uh, Google search this morning, there's about $2.4 trillion of so-called excess reserves parked at the Fed. And, and you can understand uh, a guaranteed 1.8 in today's environment maybe isn't the worst thing in the world from a banker's perspective. I mean, you can't just snap your fingers and find all kinds of credit worthy projects out there to lend to reserves aren't lent but the the point is is that they're you know you have to have a certain amount of reserves in, in, in on hold with the fed in order to lend and so uh it's interesting to me though as an aside when you talk about this panic around housing prices at the time what's so infuriating bob is that and there's a lot of young people out there, a lot of less affluent people who might very well like to see housing prices crash. Uh, you know, nobody cries big crocodile tears when oil prices crash and the oil companies make less money or when grocery prices go. You know, it's just what, what makes housing this magic uh, form of consumer durable that we should all be so sad? I mean, yeah, it's tough if you're a homeowner. I, I get that. But, you know, what about it's that's just half the equation. What about all the would be buyers? Yeah, it, it is very interesting how that has occurred. And I mean, I guess it's understandable because uh, certainly in the United States, Americans in practice, that's like your, one of your major assets that you always, oh, your house. And so you wouldn't want, just like you wouldn't, <laughs> just like you would, you wouldn't normally people wouldn't say, oh, well, you know, the, my asset portfolio, I had all these different stocks and they all went down 10%, but that's good because now stocks are more affordable. Like people don't normally think of the way if electricity becomes cheaper, gasoline becomes cheaper, like that's considered a boon to the average person. That um, So it, it is interesting, that that dynamic. And I think, again, this, this stuff all plays together. I think that's one of the insidious consequences of leaving the gold standard and well, you know other related measures is that there's such instability that people can't you know, just go buy bonds or something. And that's a real estate. You got to go, oh, you got to get into real estate. Otherwise, you're going to get killed by inflation. And then, of course, when when that volatile asset crashes, that's that's considered an unmitigated disaster. When, like you say, Jeff, it, it's interesting. People simultaneously complain about how everyone's living at home, and young people today, you know, they can't afford a new house, and there's overcrowding. And on the other hand, they also complain if, if housing prices go down. And like the Federal Reserve's explicit policy was to, to quote, you know, rescue the housing market, which in practice means making a house more expensive. Yeah, it is infuriating, but. I, I want to touch a little bit more on QE, quantitative easing. You've mentioned it a couple of times. This was the process begun after 2008 under, in a, an era of what 
Fed officials themselves call it extraordinary monetary policy, whereby they create uh, bank reserves out of thin air and purchase those, grant those to commercial banks and buy either their treasury debt in the best case scenario, but oftentimes much worse. In other words, mortgage-backed securities that they were holding, mortgages, uh, which hadn't been marked to market. I mean, imagine if when when uh, B of A was forced to buy Countrywide during the crisis period, imagine if B of A had been made to mark to market at the moment, all, all of the real value of those th- those mortgages that now held under its subsidiary country, that would have been quite ugly. And of course, that didn't happen. But so what I struggle to understand is with QE, you you give banks reserves in exchange for taking their, their mortgage-backed securities or their treasury securities off their hands. I, isn't that in effect a sort of a de facto recapitalization of the banks? In other words, they get bank reserves in exchange for assets that might have been dodgy. Yeah, so that's a great question. So one thing, let me just clarify too, is uh, where that you see different explanations for it, like why do they call it quantitative easing? Like what what's the quantitative mean in that? I mean, easing is pretty obvious. And what I've seen in enough places, I think, is the generally accepted explanation is what they were trying to do is focus on the scale of asset purchases. Because remember, up till that point. When the, whenever the Federal Reserve did something, the press would just report, oh, this is what they did with interest rates. And so the problem was that by the end of 08, the, the target interest rate, you know, the federal funds rate that we talked about before, was basically at zero, you know, like zero to 25 basis points or 0.25%. So they had already pushed that down as low as it would go, which was unprecedented, by the way. And obviously, the economy was still on the ropes. And so in terms of standard Keynesian monetary theory, like, oh, gee, well, once you push into rate to zero, what else can you do? And so that's why they said, oh, OK, instead of now telling the public this is what we're going to do with interest rates, let's start telling them this is how much money we're going to inject into the system. And so that's why they were calling it quantitative easing. Um, that, so that I think that's important because up till then, I think they actually liked – like the fact that it was a bit mysterious and probably the average person didn't understand that, oh, yeah, when the Fed announced today they were going to cut interest rates, that meant they were going to buy more assets and, quote, create more money out of thin air. Whereas, you know, <laughs> by 2009, that had become a virtue. Like the public is like, oh, please tell us how much money you're going to create out of nothing. Throw at us. Um, so, so yeah, there's that element. And then you're you're right, Jeff. It is interesting. There were different justifications given – so I think that, you know, one of the real ones that a cynic would say is, oh, yeah, because a bunch of these banks, as you say, were sitting on assets that if they had just let market forces ensue, they would have you know been marked way down and a lot of firms would have been uh, insolvent. And also, too, there was this whole fire sale problem that the concern was even firms that originally were fine once you know, asset ba- uh, mortgage-backed securities started crashing, they would be in trouble, or, or if they held credit default swaps issued by somebody that, you know, was also vulnerable, like it was going to be this cascade effect where everyone was going to have to start selling assets, and that was just going to further uh, push the prices down. So by the Fed coming in and buying them up at a floor price, that kind of calmed everybody down because they knew the Fed was sitting there as a backstop. So that's, I think, what was really going on. And then, but as you say, in the mechanics of it, yeah, that that... They were taking assets. Yes, it, it, it wasn't a loan, and I think that's what you're trying to get at, Jeff. That the um, that these the direct quantitative easing thing was different from just letting banks borrow money. So you know, letting banks borrow money from the Fed is is a is a subsidy if they're you know if they're getting it on better terms than they would get from the private sector, but that's not recapitalizing them. But whereas. An, a- an asset that originally was going to fall to a million, if the Fed's buying it from you at five million, then yeah, that's that's giving you more equity, as it were. Well, with respect to the mortgage-backed stuff, though, let's say a, a bookie had a bunch of outstanding debt obligations owed him, and some of them were of dubious collectability, and the Fed just came along and said, "Oh, don't worry about it, Mister Bookie. Just give us your book, and we'll we'll give you the cash, the the uh, you know nominal cash value of all those." Bad bets, good or good or bad, and you'll get U.S. cash. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, okay, well, you know, in other words, what industries get recapitalized and what don't? Uh, you know, apparently, banking and insurance do, and, and autos, by the way. So, you know, the whole the whole period 
if you want to read a, an excellent sort of day-by-day, week-by-week account of what was going on in those terrible months around the crisis, pick up David Stockman's The Great Deformation. Now, of course, he goes farther and argues that this, this Wall Street crisis would not have spread to Main Street. He argues that all of you know, QE and, and all of this was unnecessary. That's a, a matter of opinion. I share it. But nonetheless, if you just want to know what was happening behind closed doors with people like Hank Paulson and AIG and Countrywide and B of A and Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, I mean, it's a really, really good book. Uh, so I, I recommend it. Yeah, his uh, Stockman's chapter dealing with the 08 crisis and, and, and Stockman's – Stockman, I think, makes the best case I've ever seen, just armed with facts, you know, <laughs> overflowing – of, of why it wouldn't have been Armageddon, right? People were saying, oh, if we don't bail the banks out in the fall of 08, you know, your, your ATM card isn't going to work anymore, stuff like that, or your life insurance policies aren't going to, you know, and, and Stockman just goes through and shows why, or at least I would say that it's the most persuasive case I've seen to show that that was largely just fear mongering. So the public went along with something that was crazy. And, and also, if I, if I could just come back, I, yeah, I liked your, your book example. That was probably, <laughs> I was trying to say that, but yeah, you, you just, said it very succinctly. That was the issue. And one thing, too, I was trying, because there were a lot of economists, there was some, somewhat libertarian-ish economists, even, who were trying to say, like, the QE wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't a bailout, it was just a, an asset. So, and, and I was saying things, like, I, I used the analogy, I said, what if I was a car dealer, and the Fed came in and did quantitative easing on my inventory, and they were buying cars from me and taking it on their balance sheet, you're saying that wouldn't help me out? You think that would just be neutral in the long run because money's neutral? You know what I mean? Like it, mm-hmm. it, it did seem like they had a, a bit of a, a naive interpretation. They, they weren't being pr- practical about that. Yeah, clearly if the Fed's coming in and buying assets from you, that's a huge increase in the demand for those assets and other things equal. You would expect that's going to help you out and that's, that's going to help recapitalize you. Well, since QE is such a bizarre thing, really unprecedented, you know, the Fed's balance sheet went up over four times in the period of less than eight, eight or 10 years. I just wonder, you know, I'm looking at this old article that I mentioned at the outset of the show, Understanding uh, Fed Monetary Mechanics. It was written in 1991. I wonder how much of this stuff is out the window, Bob. And you, you actually have a section, or you're going to have a section in this series of articles about post-2008 monetary policy and how it's different. Right, exactly. So we've already touched on some of the stuff with the interest on reserves, but I mean, the idea, just what I said a minute ago, that the Fed was trying to divorce the asset purchases from setting interest rates because they needed the asset purchases to do specific things like, oh, let's re- rehabilitate or, or at least salvage, stabilize would probably be a nice soothing verb they would have used. The housing sector, I mean, they're, that's kind of unusual, right? Like I think 30 years ago or something, the idea that, oh yeah, should the Federal Reserve be intervening in specific markets to rescue certain asset classes? I think that would have been heretical to a lot of people. I said, what are you kidding me? That that's, you know, first of all, they don't, have, they don't have the ability to, to do that in an expert fashion. Like they, they would be bungling, but also look at the corruption that involves, that they got the printing press. You don't want them to be able to intervene and selectively bail out certain asset classes. That's crazy. And yet that's, that's where we are. There's even elements too, and we'll, I'll touch on this a little bit in the series, Jeff, where it's of dubious legality as to what they actually did because of the, there were, you know, there was statutory language to try to pre- prevent against this sort of thing. And they were doing things like establishing a maiden lane LLC because that, you know, that was a street in Wall Street. And like that, that LLC was going and buying these things and the Fed was just sort of lending money to the LLC. You know what I mean? So there was like a, some weird hijinks they had to do just because of the legality of it, because there were, you know, in the original enabling legislation for the Federal Reserve that, you know, there, there were protections put in place that they wouldn't just want them giving money to their buddies. Well, we can call that the fog of war. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> Hank Paulson was a wartime consigliore, that's for sure. Um, so I want to just touch on something that's been newsworthy lately, and it ties into later chapters or later sections of this of this series of articles. What, what's repo? What are the repo markets? And what was this big hubbub a month or two back about banks uh, seeming to not have enough overnight cash to fund their operations? Sure. So the the, the phrase is, is from re, the term is repurchase agreement, and they just shorten it to repo. And yeah, in terms of the simple definition, the idea is 
it was just a, a sort of quick version uh, to have a sort of standardized loan contract that was easily, you know, that you could market it to other people instead of just having a, an actual loan contract signed up between two people. So the idea would be that, oh, I have whatever, a treasury or something. And so some outside person that I want to borrow money from is, you know, they're going to buy my treasury for a certain amount of money. And then I'm going to buy it right back from them tomorrow or next week or in two weeks for more money. So if you think about what's going on there, the person's giving me cash today. And then in the tomorrow or two weeks, I'm going to give them back more dollars. And if I don't, for some reason, then they, they keep my, uh, my asset, the treasury or whatever it is that they bought from me. And so really, it's just a way of, of, of synthetically you know, creating a collateralized loan, right? With the, instead of them just borrowing money and me paying back, or instead of me borrowing money and paying them back at a certain interest rate, and if I default, they seize the treasury. It's just a, a quicker way of doing that. Right, so that's that's what it is, and for various reasons. So here now, people have more speculation as to why, but the, that market, the interest rate on that started shooting way up back in uh, it was September, right? And you know, and the the Federal Reserve was very alarmed, and they came in and had to basically fl- flood the market with very short term injections of of credit to try to push down those interest rates. They're like, oh, everything's fine, and they just they had to kind of institutionalize that process now that this was supposed to, at the time people say, Oh, this is just a one-off thing. There were a bunch of corporations that had to pay their tax bill and whatever. And that just puts them up with pressure, but don't worry about it. And yet, you know, now this is a, a recurring thing. So it's, I think it's just indicating that there is something going on with the global interconnected monetary system where you see these little pockets of, of problems jumping up and central banks can keep sort of doing whack-a-mole but i I think it is indicative that there's the system right now is not you know just slowly returning to normal i think that there was a lot that kind of swept under the rug by just drowning the world in artificial credit from 08 onwards and they didn't really solve the underlying problems but if we get away from the technical details doesn't it just seem crazy that we've had all this expansionary monetary policy since 2008 and here we find ourselves 11 years later, and we still have these banks uh, stressed out for cash. I mean, it's, why, why do we have liquidity problems? That seems crazy to me. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And it's, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like with, with every major government intervention, right? Like if, if the public had known this is how much, we're, how long we're going to be in Afghanistan, how much money we're going to spend, and what the accomplishments will have been 10 years later, 13 years, would anybody do it? No, of course not. So, yeah, I think it's a similar thing that if people had been told, in 2008, okay, this is the, the things we're going to do, and yet we're still going to be needing to come in years later. Otherwise, there's going to be a global liquidity crisis. I think people would realize, okay, well, then let's not do that. Let's just get it over with now because it looks like you're not really solving the problem. Well, so once again, I think this is going to be a great series of articles. I think it's going to help all of you tremendously to read and know and understand this stuff, in, at least in simplified format. We're very grateful to Bob Murphy for his agreeing to do this and rolling up his sleeves and applying some of his knowledge of money and banking to the really practical real world operation of how this stuff works. And uh, we very much look forward to reading it. And that said, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, uh, you know, put on your thinking caps because in the, over the coming months, we are going to tackle both Human Action by Ludwig von Mises and Man, Economy and State by Murray Rothbard in podcast form in a series of podcasts with a few different guests. So if you haven't read those books, you were thinking about reading them, you were a little uh, apprehensive about tackling them, 2020 is really the year to arm yourself with some new substantive knowledge. Uh, And so once again, we want to wish all of you a very, very happy new year. And thank you for tuning in to the Human Action Podcast. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.